welcome back to the fish room. Today I had a box of our lovely big green brokers to send to their new home. Uh, so I wanted to just share with everybody how I'm going to pack these up for their overnight journey. So these are green brokers splendens. And Corys and brokers especially, um, especially if they're large ones, I like to bag them up individually. Um, and these are going to be double bagged and I use bags that have rounded bases um, so that when you pop the bag down they're not going to get stuck in the corners. So green brocus, um, these are a very uh, hardy species. Once they've uh, acclimated into the aquarium they can go in a really wide range of temperatures. They prefer it a little bit cooler. Um, and they're a very tight shoaling species and that gorgeous uh, iridescent emerald green. They're a really, really striking fish to have in a larger aquarium. Um, lots of flow, and because of their size, they can go with slightly larger fish as well uh, that aren't going to be able to swallow them. So I don't tend to send if it's really, really super cold, um, but today I'm going to be popping four heat packs in the box, and I use biodegradable packing peanuts really important to make sure that the heat packs are warm um, before they go out and I also make sure that there's a hole in the uh, in the top of the box um, which is basically so that the heat packs can do their chemical reaction and actually produce heat. If it's packed too tightly um, the heat packs we use are designed to be used in low O2 environments um, but if it's packed too tightly and there's no hole they can actually just stop working altogether and then the fish are going to get cold. These guys are ready to go. And our new puffers, the uh, Congo puffers, Tetradon Shrutadinis, they're doing really, really well. So these are a very interesting species because they were actually really popular. They were imported about like 80 years ago originally, uh, back in the like 1960s. And then there's uh, been like civil war and various other dangerous things going on where they're from. So a lot of these now are uh, captive bred from Indonesia or Germany. There's not very many wild imports coming from uh, the Congo. So they're from uh, a place called Malebo, and I hope I'm doing that justice, um, which is it's a part where the uh, lower Congo River widens out and there's like an island in the middle of it as well. So it's uh, just a unique part of the river. Um, and it's quite clean, fast flowing, and apparently there's lots of like tall grasses and um, the, the substrate is more like silt and mud. So I'm maybe going to be trying to replicate that a little bit more in their aquascape um, over the coming weeks and months and make it more uh, biotope specific to them because um, tall grasses and things is quite a specific habitat. But basically they sift through the mud and the silt and they're always looking for food. Um, so they, they eat mostly like things like snails and worms, stuff like that, um, so they've got pretty nasty teeth on them. And they, these guys, they're going to get maybe around six inches, they are a true freshwater species. Um, six inches, I mean half of them is tail, um, but because of what they eat, they do have quite a high fire load and they do need a good bit of flow, they like quite a clean substrate and stuff. And they do chew on plants and they do nip tank mates as well. So that's going to be interesting finding out how to replicate their natural environment with these tall grasses that I've been reading about and finding something that they're not actually going to eat because apparently things like crenums, um, apparently Anubis is quite safe, um, but yeah, things like crenum, all the sort of like tall grassy stuff um, that would probably be coming from that sort of environment in Africa. Um, they're probably going to eat all of that, apparently. So the Corydoras have still been laying those eggs um, in here, and the, the puffers have now worked out how to eat them. They have started disappearing. So I've been basically cutting the leaves off this plastic plant and um, trying to save as many off the glass as possible. So we've got a little stack of them building up in the baby tank now. And uh, yeah, I'm not really sure when these are going to hatch, uh, anytime between like tomorrow and maybe towards the end of the week. It's around 26 in here at the moment, um, so yeah, it's normally temperature dependent.
the barometric pressure's on its way down, so I'm trying to um, simulate that with my water changes and really splash the water. It does seem to be having an effect on my L397s, um, so I did turn the flow down and keep them quite warm. Um, same as what I did with the quarries, and now, yeah, I've been doing uh, water changes and trying to splash them about, but um, we'll see how that goes. So the other day I picked up a beautiful pair of uh, L102 Snowball Plecos, High Pancistrus Inspector, which they're originally a Rio Negro species. And while I've got them here, I thought it'd be worth just showing a little comparison next to the L201 uh, Orinoco Angel Snowballs. So these are going to stay around 5 centimeters smaller, by about 2 inches, and they don't have a forked tail and they also don't have black edges on their fins. So the L201 Orinoco Angels are more common, i found. They've got quite stumpy little faces as well, um, a lot less pointy, especially in person, it's more obvious than um, the L102s. And as well as the L201 Snowballs, you also have the L471 Snowball, um, which they're smaller, by, only by a little bit, and they've got a more forked tail. Um, and generally I find the dorsal fins are a little bit larger as well, um, but they're just another spotted Hypancistrus species that comes under that snowball bracket. Um, they've got larger spots as well, especially when they're younger as well. And these are just the ones I have around the fish room, there's loads more. Things like the L005 Angelicus um, could be mistaken quite easily, and obviously Angelicus or Anoka Angel, they're sort of more similar names as well. And we're looking at lots of black fish with little white spots on them. The Angelicus has got smaller spots. Outside of Hypancistris, um, as an example, you've got things like the uh, mustard spot placos. Um, an easy idea is to look at the mouth. If it's diamond shaped and the uh, teeth look like nightmare fuel, it's probably not going to be a Hypancistris. If you want something bigger than that still, while we're on the topic of mouths especially, you've got something like the uh, vampire placos. These guys have got curved fangs for scooping out the insides of shelled invertebrates like snails. And they're gonna get just shy of a foot, maybe around 20 to 25 centimeters. And because Hypancistrus are more omnivorous than these, and they don't have as much of a tailored diet, knowing what polka dot spotted pleco you've got is gonna be a good starting point for making sure you're providing excellent care for these animals. And just to finish off today, I wanted to check back in with Mooncake, who I'm pleased to say is making uh, leaps and bounds. Um, he's getting more energetic by the day. I haven't worked out yet if he's blue or grey. It depends on what setting I've got the light on. Um, I mean, most of the time he looks grey. Um, but no, he's doing really well. He's not so clamped up anymore. Um, he's sort of swimming about being sort of a lot more better like, which I'm really, really pleased to see. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty positive now that he's sort of out of the woods um, after sort of acclimating him in the tank and things um, and now that he's sort of eating reliably and stuff like that, I'm, I'm really pleased with um, how he's doing really. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.